Okay, so let's take a look at some of the things that happen in the Harry Potter movies that, or books that are sometimes considered magical. One happens to be with the invisibility cloak. What do you know about the invisibility cloak? Okay, what did you say, Aaron? Harry puts it on and he becomes invisible. Okay, something he can put on to become invisible. So he sneaks around the castle and so forth um, with this. So that would be similar to, for example, this test tube in this container. Right now you can see it. Um, if I was going to use an invisibility cloak on it, I could do something like this. <laughs> and make it disappear. Now, is this really invisible? No. We know that there's just some science behind this. Not so much invisibility. Right? What's really neat about this is I can put only half of, I can dump some of this out to where it only looks like half of it here, because that's happened to Harry sometimes. Okay, now you see the top half of the test tube. But you know it's touching the bottom because you can hear me tap the bottom, even though it doesn't look like the whole test tube okay, is reaching the bottom line. So if there's really such a thing as invisibility cloaks and it's magic, uh, we wouldn't be doing it here in the classroom because this is all science based. By the way, our uh, things that we use in the military too, the stealth bombers, work on a similar principle which we'll talk about here in a minute. Now, in Harry Potter they also play a sport. What's the sport? Quidditch. Okay, Quidditch. And the unique thing about Quidditch is that it's not played on the playing field, it's played where? Above it. Above it, in the air. So we want to make a little miniature Quidditch court here. And add some of this. Okay, and what we're doing here is creating our own Quidditch field where if I put my players on it in the form of these bubbles, they should play above the surface, as you can see them, rather than underneath. So now I have my Quidditch field set up here. Okay? Now, there's some other really strange things that happen in the Harry Potter books. Sometimes they separate people's heads from their bodies. Okay? So if we were representing that with this lighter here, and the head was the flame, which what happens is I start to go down here. And I'll do it to the other side too so you can see it. So I've got it separated or discombobulated from the body here. Oh my God. This way so you can see it. That's really neat. Yeah, you can see it separated. Okay. What's even more is I can take some of this um, magical stuff. Can I have somebody come here and just hold the lighter like this for me? <laughs> Nothing strange is going to happen to you. This is one of the times you can volunteer to say. Um, I'll start with the small scale. Sometimes it doesn't work. I'm going to go to the larger effect. But what I want to do is I'm going to scoop some magical stuff out here and I'm going to douse the flame with it by pouring it. See, it almost wants to go. The cup's just not big enough. So what I'll do is this. There. I'm going to pour some. Not the liquid. Put my magic over to put it out. Okay. Yeah. Use the word magic a lot here, but everything that I just showed you okay, is science-based. So let's talk about the science behind some of this stuff. Okay, let's start with the Invisibility cloak. Does anyone have an idea how this is happening or why this is happening? Aaron? Because it blends in. Okay, blends in. So you can almost use the word camouflage here in a way. Well, let's talk a little bit about what you see if you've done this experiment before with water and say a pencil or a straw. Do you ever stick up a pencil in some water in a clear cup? What's it look like where it meets the two surfaces? It looks bent or distorted, right? Does anyone know why it looks that way? Okay, it's the refraction. It's the way the light rays are hitting back to your eyes because light travels differently, different speeds through different substances. So when this was empty, okay, this out, what was happening here is the light was traveling through the beaker and through the corn oil, this is corn oil here, at one speed, but what happens when it hits the air in the inside? It travels at a different speed. So it reflects back to your eyes so that you can see that difference in here. But what happens when I put corn oil in it, and by the way, you have to use corn oil, not vegetable oil. It has to be corn oil. And you have to use Pyrex brand beakers. Um, the generic ones have a different refractive index. But what happens is all three of these substances, the Pyrex and the corn oil and the test tube inside, all have the same refractive index. 
So when the light travels through here, it doesn't distinguish a difference. It goes the same speed through all three substances. What that does then is when it sends that image back to your eye, it looks like it's all one substance, and that's why it looks like it's invisible so that you can't see it. Okay? So it has to do with the refractive index. Any questions about that? The same refractive index? Yeah, same refractive index. Yeah. Now, if I had corn oil in here or a different type of glass, you would still see the difference because they're a little bit different. Okay? So that's the exact same refractive index. All right, so let's look at our Quidditch field that we had and talk about what we saw here. You should already know what formed when I mixed the baking soda with the vinegar, just a little larger scale than what we did. It was forming. Okay, what kind of gas? Carbon dioxide. Now let's talk about some of the properties of carbon dioxide. First of all, carbon dioxide is more dense than regular air, which means it's going to sink or float. Okay, it's going to sink. So that carbon dioxide it forms in this big container sinks to the bottom displaces the air. The air is now up higher. So when I blow the bubbles, the bubbles are heavy enough that they will sink. I, you can see I poured most of it out, but you, you can see that they'll sink till they hit the carbon dioxide level because carbon dioxide is more dense, the bubble will float on top of it. Now there's a really, another really neat thing you can do with this, but I can't do it here, there's not enough chalk dust, but if you take some dirty chalk erasers and you clap them on top of there, they will settle right on top of that carbon dioxide layer, and you can actually see the difference in the gases with a layer of chalk. Okay, so that's something else you can consider. Now, we know that in order to have a flame, you need what to burn? Oxygen. oxygen. So what happens here is when I don't have any, when I have oxygen, my flame is lit. The butane is feeding the flame. As soon as I go below the oxygen level, okay, the butane keeps rising, but it doesn't ignite until it gets to the layer of oxygen. So that's another way to tell where that layer is. Okay, so the flame separates, the butane still goes up, but it can't ignite until it hits that layer of oxygen. So that's how that works. Since you know that, and you know that this carbon dioxide is heavier, what happened when I tipped this over the flame? Carbon dioxide poured out, displaced the oxygen, snuffed out the flame. Back to the chalk idea, you have that line of chalk dust in there and you pour it, it's really neat because it goes down and you see the chalk dust rolling across the ground as it goes along there. So that's another thing to keep in mind when you're doing this. Alright, so here were a couple of discrepant events that um, appear to be magic, but we know that they are really a lot of science behind it. So what we're going to do now is take a look at another Harry Potter activity that will show you what scientists do since they don't have magical sorting hats. I'll show you how they sort stuff. Okay, let's turn this off first. And uh, while we're doing this, I'm going to...